evening and welcome to Ideas at Work and Beyond. You see on your television screen a guy who... I just want to be honest with the viewing audience here. I am a Christian gentleman. I try to have a worldview that says none of us are perfect. We're all just redeemed by the love of Jesus Christ. But there are some of us that I come across as I walk around this planet that really, really tick me off and, and test my Christian patience. And I was thinking about this earlier this week. There are two that come to mind right off the bat. And we'll start with this guy. You, hopefully, maybe you've forgotten about it now. I hope you have. But this guy from Brewster, of all places, wonderful people in Brewster, <laughs> but this guy, Michael Enright. Now, is that the one you have up on, on uh, the New York Times? I love the caption, or uh, the New York Post, where they say, what a disgrace. For those of you who may not have, this, this happened a couple weeks ago now, on August 20th. This, this idiot is, uh, gets all liquored up. He's got some vague ideas about Muslims and terrorism, and he thinks he, you know, hates terrorists and hates Muslims. He gets into a cab. Turns out this guy was over in Afghanistan making some sort of film or, or something or other. Gets in a cab. He's drunk to high heaven. Takes out some kind of a knife or a, or a uh, um, uh, screwdriver or something like that. Asks this hardworking cab driver, are you Muslim? He says, yes, he's Muslim. And he proceeds to start stabbing and cutting at this guy. This poor cab driver is just out there trying to make a living, try to, try to practice his religion in America, the home of the free and the land of the brave, where you have freedom of religion, freedom of expression. It's a, it's a wonderful melting pot. And here's this idiot that goes off and uh, takes, out, takes off after this cab driver because he finds out he's Muslim or something like that. Guys like that, I like, I applaud the New York Post when they put him on the front cover and they say, what a disgrace. I don't know what that guy was thinking. And then, to make matters worse, you got this guy, Terry Jones, the Reverend Terry Jones. His, uh, his church, or what he calls a congregation, I guess it's only like 50 people, uh, Dove World Outreach Center. Now, for the record, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I practice my religion. I raise my family in the Christian faith. And I think there is truth in Christianity. I really, really, really do. But this guy is an idiot. He's a complete idiot. He decides that he's going to have the burn a Koran day on 9-11 right in front of his, his two-bit wayward ridiculous church down there in Gainesville, Florida. Now, it turns out today, I guess he's uh, rethought himself and uh, has decided this probably isn't the best idea to do. And it isn't. But these two guys, when we talk about relations with, with uh, Muslims, when we talk about America, when we talk about terrorism and fighting the battle against extremist Islamic terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and, uh, and some of these uh, Hamas uh, gets to be, you know, with the Israeli-Palestinian peace discussions, I have no love for terrorist organizations. I had a good friend named Boyan Costas uh, on the 98th floor of Tower Number 1 wor working for Cantor Fitzgerald and at 8.30 on 9-11 the last thing he did was get, uh, put a message into his fiance at the time and says something's hit the building I'm getting out of here that's the last we heard of Boyan Costas I've got no love for Muslim terrorists or these extremist groups but these guys like this idiot in Brewster that goes off stabbing cab drivers because they're Muslims or this uh, two-bit quote-unquote reverend uh, from down in Florida that decides it's going to be a good idea to go burn the Koran on the front lawn of his church there's just no room for that that's not how we operate in the United States yes you have freedom of expression yes you have freedom of religion but what this this intolerance that you see here is completely and utterly unacceptable so I, I don't mean to start on a, on a downer but those are just a couple things that I wanted to get off my chest okay from the ridiculous to the all-important, the NFL football season started tonight. David, do we have a score with the uh, New Orleans Saints versus the Minnesota Vikings? Yes. Well, would you like to share that score with our vast viewing audience? 
Okay, David is working on We have a crack technical team here that is working on that score, <laughs> and we will keep you posted. For me and my pool that I'm in, no money changes hands. It's just bragging rights. I'm going with New Orleans tonight because Brett Favre, God bless him, he's a little old, and that gray beard's going down. Oh. So we'll see. Brett we'll see. Favre, we'll, love for I got love for Brett Favre, but no, I saw him in the preseason, and he was looking a lot like... Kurt Warner, who <laughs> had his day, and at some point, there's a point of diminishing return. Okay, thank you for letting me get that off my chest. Oh, here we go. See, Saints, they're already marching it right down the field, 7 nothing. I think we might be violating some copyright laws here with the NFL, but what are they going to do? Sue us? <laughs> We're not showing any footage. We'll keep you posted on the score. But tonight, we, have, we are delighted to have John Hartwell joining us. John, I really appreciate Party. it. As far as Democrats go, you're probably one of my favorite Democrats. Well, thank you. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Uh, it's wonderful. Okay. And you are running for state senate, yep. and you're running against Tony Boucher, yes. who's the incumbent. Yes. And you ran against her last year, yep. uh, or no, two years ago, and uh, and you're back at it. I am. If nothing else, I appreciate it. Stick-to-itiveness. Yeah. We are also joined by Al Robinson of Hat City Blog fame. Mm. This man, politicians uh, all around the greater Danbury, able, Grand Danbury area quake <laughs> when they hear that Hat City Blog is on their case. Yeah. And David Strait is with us as well of the uh, website Straight Talk, which has a lot of good stuff. And uh, and Al, you had some questions for John, and you wanted to get it started. Yeah. Well. Um Right off the bat, you ran two years ago, all right, and um, just give me a, just can you explain to the audience why you decided to run again? Well, two years ago, um, we had a completely different world, and certainly at the beginning of the campaign two years ago, um, no one could have foreseen the kind of trouble that we have today, and it was toward the end in September when the financial services world really started to come apart, mm -hmm. and uh, Certainly after that, uh, you know, we were losing jobs at 700000 a month at the national level. And, uh, you know, we've had a very tough year and a half. And the state budget uh, that we're operating under today uh, was balanced only by borrowing, by federal stimulus money, by uh, putting off um, uh, contributions to the pension fund, a lot of one-time shots, and also by spending down the rainy day fund, which when I was here last time, we had a $1.3 billion rainy day fund. Today it's down to nothing. So um, the state's in trouble, and uh, I think I can help. I want to come to the table with some new ideas. Um, first, I think we need to balance the budget without borrowing, if we can, uh, which is going to be tough because we have a $3.3 billion uh, deficit that we're looking at in the next fiscal year, starting next July. Uh, that's that's the estimate, and it doesn't get any better the year after that or the year after that. So, uh, some estimates say 10 billion dollars over three years. Um, huge numbers. Uh, we have a 19 billion dollar budget today. So, if we're looking at 3.3 billion uh, of uh, shortfall, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent down. So, we need to come forward with some new ideas, some new ways of thinking about the state government. And, and in general, I would say that we need to rethink government and come to a, you know, a consensus across the board. We have to get everybody involved and say, how much government do we really want and how are we going to pay for it? Uh, I think what's, both what's of those the answer to that? How much government do we want? I, th I think that's a conversation that we're going to have to have as a state. I, I can't sit here today and say, we need this one and we don't need that one. I I've got some ideas, but there's not one person who's going to be able to say, this is how much government we need. Um, it's got to be a community effort here. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't you think do the that, election in, in some levels will answer that question? I think the, it will in some levels for sure. Absolutely. But then there'll be a lot of heavy lifting after that and it's not going to be easy. Because the trend at the national level is for massive more government, right? The majority of jobs that have been crea supposedly created over the course of the last two years have been at the, the federal level, government jobs. I don't think that's the case. If you look uh, the last six months, the private sector, new job growth in the private sector, other than the blip around the census, where you know, there was a run-up in the census jobs, and then, of course, that ran right back down. Those were all, all, all temporary. But the new jobs at the federal level... Uh, the you know, private industry is leading the way. 
So I don't know where, you know, obviously there's going to be new mandates involved with the health care at the federal level, which you know, we're going to have to implement a lot of that here at the state level over the next couple of years. But um, in terms of job growth, no, the federal government is not leading the way. Uh, the, job, the job growth at the federal level has been quite substantial. I mean, the explosion in the deficit has, has partly been around the explosion in the size of the government. I think the explosion in the deficit at the federal level has, is primarily due to two major factors. The tax cuts that were put in in 2001 under Bush and the wars that we've been fighting on the, on the credit cards. That's, that's, where the, that's where the debt has come from, not from explosion in federal jobs. We reduced jobs under Clinton. The uh, federal government actually shrank uh, directly as a result of the, uh, the work that Al Gore did in reinventing government in the late 1990s. Uh, so if there's been an explosion in federal government in the last decade, it's been under the Bush administration. But the debt is definitely coming directly from the wars that we're fighting and from the fact that we're not paying taxes for it. So the federal stimulus package that we passed federal didn't have anything to do with adding to the debt? No, obviously it did. The federal stimulus package uh, is sort of the icing on the cake, but it is not the major part of the deficit, that's, uh, the debt that's been growing over the last 10 years. I mean, you know, I work for a living. Sure. And maybe I don't study this stuff as much as you do, but there was a statistic that stuck in my mind, and that is if you start with the spending of George Washington and go through all presidents and all the administrations right up until the end of George Bush number two's you know, uh, um, administration and put that all together, adjusted it for inflation. Barack Obama in the first 20 months that he's been in office has spent one third of all of that, all that revenue combined. Uh, uh, this is a statistic I've not seen, so I have uh, no way to comment. Okay, but you're, you're going to sit here and you're going to tell us that the reason that we have this massive debt that has happened over the last 20 months since Barack Obama has been in office doesn't have to do with Barack Obama, but it has to do with tax cuts that George Bush put in and two wars. Oh, now Marty, you just said the deficit, the debt over the last 20 months. Yes. The debt over the last 20 months comes from the fact that we are still fighting those wars and we still have those tax cuts and we've added deficit spending in order to avoid a Great Depression. Absolutely, there's been debt added in the last 20 months. I, I never would say that's not the case. Okay. The major part of the debt that we're facing at the moment, however, is not attributable to Barack Obama. And it, it, you, know, you need to look at the numbers very okay. closely. So the, the overall debt, I think it's, I mean, it, it, something along the lines of 13, 14 trillion dollars, and he's responsible for two or three of those. But the rest has been built up before. The stimulus then. package was uh, less, than a, less than a trillion, and a third of that was tax cuts. Mm -hmm. So the spending piece of that was around 550 uh, billion dollars, mm -hmm. and some of that hasn't even kicked in yet. So if you're looking at 15 trillion in debt, no, he's not responsible for two mm -hmm. or three. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying yeah. to, you know. No, he's not. Uh, not anywhere make, close. make your point as not far, anywhere as, far close. as that goes. No. Um, okay, so would you say that? Because let's bring it to Connecticut, because you're running for state senator yep. of Connecticut. Do you think Connecticut has a spending problem, or do you think Connecticut has a, a, a problem that we're not paying enough in taxes? I think Connecticut has a problem primarily of being over-reliant on the financial services industry. Mm -hmm. And when financial services was doing well, David, you were part of the financial services industry, you know how well that industry has been doing and had been doing, especially up to about September of, of 2008. Mm -hmm. We were putting money in the bank. We had a rainy day fund that we added to by 200, 300, 400 million dollars a year because the tax money that was coming in more than offset the money that we were spending. Suddenly, there was this huge, um, what, what would you call it, collapse? Tsunami. Tsunami, thank you. Sure. A, a, a tsunami of... of uh, Epic proportions. Epic. Sorry, go ahead. What a man. <laughs> so, uh, Bear Stearns goes under, Lehman Brothers goes under, uh, Merrill Lynch gets sold, um, you know, the market is going crazy. Uh, the income taxes that we had been collecting, 40% of the income taxes in the state come out of Fairfield County. Mm -hmm. Much of that... 17% out of one town. Richfield. No, Greenwich. Oh, Greenwich. <laughs> yeah. Much of the income tax 
in the state uh, actually was predicated on financial services bonuses. Yeah. So when that went away, we went from having a surplus to having a huge deficit. Now, that industry is going to come back. To it sounds degree. like we need to cut spending since we don't have as much money. Isn't that right, Mr. Harwell? Uh, we're definitely going to have to cut spending. Okay. But you asked me where the problem was. Yes, I did. Uh, and you so didn't answer. I'm going to get there. Okay. Right. Got to, to understand what to do about it, you have to understand what the problem is. Okay. All right. So in addition to income tax going down, we also lost heavily in sales taxes because as the economy worsened, people stopped spending. People got a lot more conservative in their own household spending. So instead of flying to you know, uh, Europe for the summer, maybe mm -hmm. people got in a car and drove to Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, definitely been a decrease in spending, which then has hit the income tax. And those are the two big taxes in the state, income taxes and sales taxes. And then at, at the local level are property taxes, and the property taxes are obviously set by the towns. Mm -hmm. So those haven't gone down. In fact, those are generally going up. Um, so what do we have? We have a hole in revenue. We have a $19 billion deficit, or not deficit, we have a $19 billion budget this year. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, how did they cover the gap? In this past year, they borrowed money. They securitized some electric rate surcharges, which I thought was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. They got federal stimulus money. Thank God that that money came in, because otherwise we would have had to lay off teachers and firemen. Um, and uh, there was other kinds of borrowing. They, as I said, they, uh, Jody Rell worked out a deal with the state employees so, saying, uh, we'll be willing to, if you're willing for us to defer a hundred million dollars in pension contributions, mm -hmm. we won't lay anybody off. Well, that's a terrific deal for the unions, and it came from the governor, because mm -hmm. they, they, they basically give up nothing. We still owe them that hundred million dollars. Absolutely. But, and they didn't have to give up anything on the job side. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was a great deal for them, and we're operating under that until uh, she walks out the door. Um, so the next governor coming in and the next legislature coming in have got a, a really difficult task. Now, you guys say, how, how are we going to balance this budget? Uh, the first thing we're going to have to do is look very hard across the board at everything that we do at the state government level. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the places that we can look for some guidance on that is a commission that was set up last year. It's called the Commission on Enhancing Agency Outcomes. It's an awful name. But it's a bipartisan commission. Uh, it was uh, chaired by uh, the head of the Appropriations Committee and on both the Senate and the House side. But there were a significant number of Republicans involved in that, including Dan DeVisella, who's been on your show. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike McLaughlin was also part of that group. Um, so it's not, it wasn't one-sided. It wasn't a Democratic effort. It was a bipartisan And they came effort. up with a, a, a They've come up a with a laundry, laundry list of things to look at at the state level. Um, and maybe there's 500 million, maybe there's a billion dollars that you can save out of the 19 billion, mm -hmm. out of the 3.3 billion dollar deficit. Maybe there's a billion dollars that you can reasonably find in the short run to balance the budget. Beyond that, things get really, really difficult. And um, I can't quite frankly tell you exactly what sort of deals and deals, what sort of agreements will be made. I don't you know, say the word deal, that's a, that's a, has a pejorative aspect to it. There's been a lot of dealing going on, John, a There's lot a dealing of dealing. There has been. A lot of people aren't real happy. Let's just throw it out there real quick. How do you, and I brought this, up, brought this up last week, how do you address this deficit without saying whether or not you're going to raise taxes? Do you think there, in, in, it's somewhere down the line raising taxes have to be put on the table? And it's really interesting. Um, I saw an article uh, quoting Tom Foley, mm -hmm. Republican governor candidate, um, and he was saying that he thought that um, that municipalities should be allowed to explore other revenue raising uh, areas. So Tom Foley, while he says at the state level he can balance the budget without uh, raising taxes, is saying that the municipalities probably can't and should be allowed to do sales taxes or hotel taxes or other kinds of taxes at the local level. Yeah, but Why? let me just let me just you know, one I'm on the Board of Finance for the town of Ridgefield. Yep. And I'll tell you exactly how we did it. Because we had a one point like one point six million dollar shortfall when the bottom dropped out as you described at the end of 08, beginning of calendar year 09, which is sort of right in the middle of our fiscal year. And Rudy Marconi 
Good friend of yours, yep. not from my political tribe, but nonetheless. A good friend of yours, however. A good friend of mine, too. Yeah. But he, you know, to his credit, as soon as that happened, came in and cut. Mm -hmm. He put on a hiring freeze. Mm -hmm. All the key people from the superintendent mm -hmm. to the first selectman to the fire chief had a, mm -hmm. a wage freeze. Mm -hmm. And then he went down the list and said, where are we going to save money? There wasn't any talk of raising new taxes or putting in new taxes. And I ask you, what did Governor Rell do at the same time? Well, I think Governor Rell came up with a very fiscally restrained budget that was de dead on arrival because the Democrats control Hartford and have for decades. They, ha they certainly don't control Hartford. They don't. No, last, really. Last so 20, there's, last a, there's a years, majority in the last, state no, senate, excuse me. and there's a majority in the House of Representatives. You said control Hartford. We have a yeah. strong governor's system, and we've had a Republican governor for the last 20 years. So you cannot say that the Democrats control Hartford. Everything that has been done in Hartford in the last 20 years, uh -huh. except the last budget when Jody Rail walked away from it, uh -huh. every one of them has been negotiated with a Republican governor and signed off. And every bit of bonding, every bit of debt, uh -huh. has only come to the table because the governor allowed it. Uh -huh. So what you're suggesting is that the Democrats in Hartford have been yearning for a streamlined, fiscally conservative government and aren't beholden to the unions and the big spending and every place else. And it's only the dreaded Republicans that want to just spend, spend, spend that have uh, raised the debt level, which now, in case you're wondering, is the highest in the country at $4,859 for every man, woman, and child in the state of Connecticut is operating under. That is number one out of the 50 states. And also, this is a, you know, people don't think it's that big a deal. I do. Tax Freedom Day, there are 50 states. Connecticut has the latest Tax Freedom Day. We have to work until April 27th to pay our state, federal, and local taxes. That's the latest date of any state in the union. All right, so there's a lot there to unpack. Um, first of all, you know, Rather than put words in my mouth, you ought to ask me a question that's not quite so leading. Um, I never said that it was all the Republicans. What I have said is that the Republican governors in the last 20 years have been just as much at the table for all of the spending, all of the debt that's gone on. So it is a bipartisan situation that we face, uh -huh. and we're going to need to find a bipartisan way to get out of it. That's one. Secondly, in terms of your tax day, as you just said, that includes federal taxes. Mm -hmm. When you look at state and local taxes, Connecticut is nowhere near the top. So mm -hmm. you need to unpack the statement here and say, you know, a lot of this is federal, and we get we pay the highest federal taxes in the country because we're the richest state in the country, and that's we have, with a progressive tax system, that's what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. In this state, when you look at state and local taxes, we are nowhere near the top, and when you look at business taxes, we are way down the list. So. You know, the idea that Connecticut is somehow overtaxed is not true. Now, that doesn't mean, and I'm going to not let you do this to me, this doesn't mean... we got an hour. you got all the time got, in the world. Exactly, but you're going to set me up with, so now you want to raise taxes. No, I do not want to raise taxes. Repeat, do not want to raise taxes, okay? Are, you, are we almost at the read my lip, no new taxes? I know, I didn't say that. Okay. I do not want to raise taxes. Okay. And when we get to Hartford in January, everybody's going to have to look as closely as possible at where we can cut and see how far we can get. But $3 billion, 15 to 20 percent of the current budget, in terms of cutting it all at one time, is, I think, very, very difficult. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I'm sure someone could come up with some kind of a, approach to do that. I don't think you would have much of a government left, and I don't think for, for, for sure that you would have any state aid to the towns. So you on the Board of Finance would have to go scrambling for a lot more revenue than you did this past year. No, no. Well, maybe because not. Because we cut. Yeah. We cut. And how much see, state that's revenue what I, that, do you that's what You see, that, that, that's the mindset is the, oh, well, you're going to have to raise taxes there, raise taxes there. Raise. Listen, there are people out there right now that are sitting at their kitchen table, and you, you mentioned, because you said, like, let's take one example, the, the financial industry, those bonuses aren't coming in. That's true. They're not. They're not. They're, they can't go. You know, get a second and third job. Well, maybe some of them are, but they're saying we need to tighten our belts. Yep. We just can't live fat and happy like and we I, have for the last decade. And I say decade. exactly the same thing. No, you're We're not. You're saying. You're saying. 
We have to tighten our belt, but there's only a billion in savings. That's it. We've looked everywhere. After that, we got to gouge the taxpayers some more and get some more money. I said, How late do you want us to work until exactly? April 27th? Let's move on. May, June, July? I mean, should, it be, should we just get half the money to the government, and, you know, even in these tough economic times? What I said before was it will have to cut that there's a billion dollars that are relatively John, on the table. John, John. It's just us here. That's okay, true. nothing but us chickens in the coop here. Yep. Okay, and we, you're sounding a little bit like, you know, an overbearing father who's saying, well, we're going to have to cut, but after we're done with that, here comes the tax increases because there's no way that we can possibly run this state without all the, this money. That's what I'm sensing you're saying. You can be honest. It's public access. Hardly anyone's watching this show. Just lay it on the line here and say, look, vote for me. I'm going to go to Hartford. We're going to try and do some savings, but we're beholden to the union, so we're going to raise taxes on you. Let me, we let don't me, raise taxes let me, now. Let me change, let me change a little bit and give them a, give them a break here. Um, do you think it's unrealistic for any politician who is going to run for state office to say that we're absolutely not going to raise taxes? Uh, we, we've, we've had Mike Fidelli, who, who's running in the primary, said, you know, I'm taking a no-tax pledge. I'm promising no tax increases. With, with the $3.3 with the $3 billion dollar, you know, situation we have going into the next year, do you think it's unrealistic to take tax increases off the table? I think or that, not being true? Not, not no, being true I, there's, people. There's, there's three things that we can do, limited to three things. You can either cut, you can raise taxes, or you can borrow more money. Um, and None, none of those are what people really want to see. People are pretty happy with the government they've got, they're just not happy paying for it. Well, that, that doesn't include me. Okay. I mean, to, to, to Marty's point, when, our, when, our, budget gets, when, our, budget, so you know when our budget gets tight at a personal level, we cut expenses. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we live within our means. Why is it so hard for the government to live within, within its means? Why is it that, that expenses aren't ever really addressed it the way they should be. In other words, I'll give you an example. I had a, an exchange with Jim Himes this week, and Jim said, well, listen, you know, this is the wrong time to cut, I'll tell you. We can maybe cut 1%, and we'll send the right signal, blah, blah, blah. Well, to me, I mean, that was like taking an aspirin when we need radical surgery. It's like getting out the duct tape after the Titanic has hit the iceberg. What we need, I mean, we have the highest corporate tax rates in the world. We're not competitive. We need to get corporate tax rates down. We need to have incentives for jobs. We need, we need to start talking about cutting pensions. We've got bloated pension obligations across the country. Cut, states like Connecticut will not be able to meet those obligations at the rate we're going. I mean, why can't we renegotiate those? Okay, so let's talk about pensions. Um, state of Connecticut is in the middle of a 20-year pension deal. Who negotiated that to begin with? Maybe John Rowland when Maybe he wasn't John Rowland. hanging out in his hot tub that was built Maybe by state John contractors. Maybe John Rowland. But a 20-year deal, 20-year deal on the table. Looks it's like good. Mayor Malloy in it, Stanford. It's good to Note 20. Yourself, Google that one. It's going to 2017. Okay. So pensions and health care locked in. Now you can tell it's the the unions that they have to come to the table, or there's going to be massive job cuts, and that's probably what's going to be said to them. But at the you know at the moment we have a contractual obligation to those people to the people who have already retired there's i would think an ironclad obligation you're not going to go back and tell somebody who who worked under a certain set of rules uh, and who sub, you know, said, this is what I'm giving up now in order to get something later on and then you come back and say well I'm sorry you can't have it because I don't want to pay any more taxes so it's a very difficult situation the pension thing is locked into 2017 and again, it's a bipartisan deal here. It was negotiated by Roland, it was approved by the state legislature, and it's in place till 2017. Now, we can work around the edges of that, or we can go right at it and say to the, to the unions, you know, you have to give up, or you know, we're gonna slash jobs. Um, and actually, I'm not sure to what degree we can slash jobs. I truly don't know. You know how easily one can say, you know, we're gonna take out 20% of DOT. Now, the other thing that's happened in pensions, just to get the whole thing out on the table, is under Roland and REL, there have been three early retirement programs. Now, what's, what happens then? Number one, you, you uh, entice the most senior people who are paying the most money to leave because it's a retirement program. So it's an early retirement program. So you have 
by the way, lost the people who knew what was going on and, and made the place work to the degree that it works. Number two, they stop paying into their pension the moment they walk out the door. So you have decreased the revenue coming into the pension stream. And number three, the added bonus, they start drawing. So you have just turned it around. Okay, and they get full benefits when they retire early? They get, not only do they get full benefits when they retire, but they also get advanced benefits because it's an early retirement program. So if you were five years short or three years short or something, you know, all of this is given to you now as an enticement to walk out the door. So we've done that three times in the last few years under the Republican administrations that each one of those has added to the pension problems that we've got. We have a huge pension problem. Everybody understands that. We're going to have to address it. Everybody understands that. How do you get to the unions to the table? Not going to be easy because they've got this deal here. It was negotiated, it's signed, sealed, and delivered. Now, that actually constitutes a large part of you know, what we've got out there in, in terms of deficits, uh, unfunded deficits. And we're going to have to work on that. So the incoming administration and the incoming legislature has got a huge problem on its plate. Now you can say, cut, 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 and we're going to have to cut, cut, cut. But I don't know, and I can't promise, and I won't promise, that there won't be some kind of revenue that has to come out of this somewhere. It's either going to be borrowing or revenue. Don't know which. Don't want either one of them. But I, I don't know that in the short run we have any choice. Now let me just try to turn the conversation a little bit here. What we really need are more taxpayers, not more taxes. Bake a bigger pie. Bake a bigger pie. I agree Amen with you 100%, and I've got some ideas for that, and I'd like to spend some time talking about how we do that, because that is where we have the opportunity to come out of this on the other end. And right now things look bleak. There's no doubt about it. But this country has always been very entrepreneurial and very optimistic, and I refuse to believe that we can't grow our way out of this. It's not going to happen in a year, but we definitely can turn this around and have a much stronger economy where taxes are coming in because people are making money and spending money, not because we've raised them. So That's what, I mean, you know, your patron saint, John F. Kennedy, who I think was a great president, cut taxes, revenue to the government went up. Ronald Reagan, who maybe you don't like so much. You can roll your eyes and cut paw if you want to. I'm telling you facts. Ronald Reagan <laughs> okay. cut taxes. Okay. Revenue, revenue to the revenue to the government doubled over the ten years of the 1980s. Doubled. Now I know I know it's better for you if <laughs> we tough, just huh? raise if we just raise taxes. <laughs> I love this. I just love this. I just what, love what did this. I say that was not true? Why would you smile and roll your eyes? When John Kennedy cut taxes, yes, he cut. They, in those days, the marginal tax rate was around 90%. Today, the marginal tax rate is what? 36, 37%, right? Yeah. So it's a completely different world. Okay. When John Kennedy cut taxes, he was cutting them on corporate, uh, the, you know, corporate gains taxes, which were way higher than they Capital are today. Gains. Capital gains, I'm sorry. Capital gains taxes. And that did unleash some short-term revenue because people who've been sitting on things went out and sold them. Today, capital gains taxes are much lower, and there's much less of an issue of someone selling simply because the tax rate came down a few okay. points. He took the tax rates down a lot. Ronald Reagan, when he lowered the tax, when, when taxes got lowered in 1981, yes. we had huge deficits that started, and we added tremendously to the debt in the 1980s. He also had a big military spending program. Yes, he did. So there's another example of somebody who wanted to cut taxes and at the same time didn't want to cut spending. Not and that's exactly what happened with George Bush. They cut taxes and they didn't cut spending and we get a huge deficit. And you know, when people want to say, oh, look at the Republicans because they manage the budget so well, mm -hmm. the only time in the last 30 years when we've actually paid down the debt and had a surplus, a running surplus, was, was when under the Clinton. Republicans took over the was Congress under Clinton. in 1994. Under so hold on, but you, but you can't have, you can't have it both ways here. You can't blame Jody Ralph for everything bad. I'm not, and yet I'm give not, Clinton for everything good. I'm not doing. I'm, I'm not doing any of that. But I want to point out that the only time at the federal government level in the last 30 years, when instead of adding to the debt, we were okay. paying it down because we had surpluses in the budget, was under Clinton. You may remember when Bush took over, Alan Greenspan said, well, you know, maybe we should 
cut taxes because we're going to pay down the deficit so quickly that we'll run out of debt and then they then the Federal Reserve won't have that lever to use anymore. You remember that he said that. Mm -hmm. Well, where are we today? So at the federal level, the last 10 years in terms of debt and deficit has been horrendous. And you cannot blame the Democrats for that. The Republicans were in charge of both houses of Congress and the presidency mm -hmm. from 2001 up to 2006. And that's when the, most of the damage was done. So let's, let's, let's be honest here. You know, the last 30 years at the federal government level, the, the record is pretty clear. Uh, now at the state level, as I've been trying to say, I'm not blaming Joe Durrell and Roland for everything, but I want to say that they were at the table. It was a bipartisan decision, and you cannot simply blame the Democrats who had control of the, of the House and the Senate. It's like, it's like two young boys got caught, you know, lighting a fire in the garage, and Dad showed up, and he says, well, he was here too. He did it here. You know, he did it too. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting story. So let me, let me, let me, just real quick. The phone number is 438-2003. If you'd like to jump in this mud fight, go right ahead. 438-2003. The Saints are still winning. I told you. I told you. The Vikings uh, kicked the field goal. Pre apparently, Brett Favre, God bless him, couldn't get it in the end zone. Um, no need to watch a football game. You stay right here. And please, don't hesitate to call 438-2003 if you'd like to have a question for our guest this evening, John Hartwell. Al. Let's talk about the 26th district for a second. We keep talking about states. For some reason, we're talking about federal. I don't understand why. But let's just talk we're about talking your philosophy, policy. Oh, well, Are okay. we taxed? I want to talk about the. We? I want to talk about the candidate running for the 26th district. You want to talk like, about like potholes and stuff like that? I want to talk. Those are important to local people, especially okay. the 26th district, who You're are right. going to vote for the next state senate. So tell me some of the issues that you see in the 26th district. All right. Well, jobs is clearly the most important issue on the table, mm -hmm. along with the budget. There's no doubt about that. And everybody out there is talking about how can we bring jobs back to Connecticut. Yeah. All right. So I have some ideas on that. Um, Fairfield County has quite a few people who are in the venture capital business. And they're out there raising money to help entrepreneurs start new businesses. Unfortunately, most of that money doesn't end up here in Connecticut. The jobs don't land here. The businesses don't come here. They get set up somewhere else, although the guys who are raising the money are here. And it doesn't mean that the money is necessarily coming from here, but a lot of the guys who are raising the money are here. This is a very active venture capital market. Mm -hmm. We have in Fairfield County a tremendous reserve of highly educated people who want to work. Uh, we have people who have left uh, the you know industry for one reason or another because a lot of these layoffs and, right. and uh, you know companies going under. We have a lot of other people who are uh, sitting in places that they'd rather not be, but there's not a lot of opportunity for them to. Right. Uh, highly educated, which is one of the most important things in terms of job creation, is that you have a highly educated workforce mm -hmm. so that when someone comes here with a company, they've got a place to go. We also are sitting next to New York City, which has been great for financial services, but it's also great for some other uh, industries. For example, the new media. Uh, there's a lot of new media in New York, and there's actually a lot of new media here in Fairfield County. Right. Yeah. There are people who today live in like, Brooklyn. Like the tax cut for the film industry that Connecticut, and, and you won't believe it, but you cut the taxes on an industry, and guess what happened? It flourished! Yes. Go figure! Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, we'll talk about that one in a minute. Yeah. That's, that's not quite so clear cut as simply cutting taxes and it flourishes. Um, but there are, there are a lot of new media people operating here in Fairfield County already. There are lots of kids who are getting off the train. They live in Brooklyn. They live in, in Manhattan. They actually get on the train in the morning and they come out to work in Stanford and Greenwich and in Norwalk. Hmm. So we have opportunities here, for example, in new media. We have offer opportunities in uh, information services to build new businesses here. So I want to work with venture capitalists to, s to go to them and say, what will it take, what incentives do we need, what programs do we need to put in place mm -hmm. so that you will encourage the people for whom you're, you're raising money to bring those businesses here, start them here in Connecticut. Uh, if, you, if you look at the reports, one of the things it says is that you need to have clusters. That one business by itself is not going not right. to work. If you look at Silicon Valley in, in uh, California, 
one of the advantages that they have there is if you're working for Yahoo and you don't like it anymore, you can go across the street to Google right. or down the road to Apple or to something. There is a concentration of those kinds of industries. Well, we can build a concentration of those industries, of not those, not the Silicon Valley stuff here, but new media we can build right here off of what's going on in New York. And so we're talking about graphic arts, we're talking about computers, we're talking about film, mm -hmm. we're talking about video. There are some, um, some studios uh, operating today in Stanford. Um, several uh, TV shows are now right, being uh, shot in Stanford. NBC Universal's in Stanford. Right NBC now. Universal's in Stanford. There's several uh, syndicated. So what would you do to attract these industries? Uh, we need to Besides talk. having really good cappuccino. Uh, <laughs> it's going to take some tax incentives. It's going to take um, a, uh, a, a dedicated approach to building infrastructure. So, for example, Norwalk Community College, where I've been a student, um, has got terrific graphic arts programs. It's also got a good video program. Uh, these are fundamental skills that would go into a new media business. We need to enhance what's going on at Norwalk Community College, mm -hmm. uh, put in the same sort of thing at Stanford at, at, uh, at the Yukon uh, uh, campus there, and then work very hard to connect that to entrepreneurs who want to come in, make sure that they understand what's going on. Right. The model here is very clear. You look at um, Research Triangle Park down in North Carolina, which is extraordinarily successful. It's been there for 20, 30 years. They've brought in some of the best technology companies in the country. Uh, they've got a strong intellectual base uh, around Duke and, and University of North Carolina and the other schools that are in that region. Uh, they, they had the right mix of tax incentives, of uh, focused work at the state level. I think that uh, at, this, at its state level here in Connecticut, we've had a terrible um, uh, economic development program. It's just been, it's, it's, it's scattered. Connecticut is considered the most business unfriendly environment in the country. Uh, nonsense. The, well, uh, I'm just telling you what I, I, this I, one I, survey I, I, says. I, I, You've I, heard I, it before. I've heard it. Okay. I, you hear it all the time. It's nonsense. Uh, there, was a, there was a report that came out today or yesterday from Yukon mm -hmm. that shows that, for example, in terms of manufacturing costs, we're 43rd in the country. We're near the bottom in terms of manufacturing costs. Uh, so, you know, to say that we're business unfriendly or that we're, we're not co price competitive is really wrong. There are problems here. Housing costs are way too high. Electric rates costs are, are way too high. Mm -hmm. the, the deregulation we had of the electric industry 10 years ago has been a failure. We now have the highest electric rates in the country. We've got to bring those down. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not an expert business, in Business there. leaders have that, complained. That's a real a stretch to try and bl blame high electricity prices in Connecticut on deregulation. Sorry, that's just not fair. I mean, what, it, what is Connecticut doing to bring in more electricity and power? I mean, I don't see anybody saying, hey, let's build another nuclear plant. I don't either. Sure would be and great, though, be, wouldn't it? We should be looking at that. I, I think we should, agree. too. I absolutely agree we should be looking at nuclear energy for a lot of reasons. And, and environmentalists, I know it's a lot Works of Works for the French. It certainly does. They get 80% of their electricity from, from nuclear. I believe the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy to look at it. It's I mean, really, in the Midwest, power rates have collapsed, right? I mean, very, very low in the, in the Midwest. And why is that? Because they found sources of power. Right. So, say, to so say Connecticut has p high power rates because of deregulation, that's just not right. We just don't produce power up here. We don't produce power, and I don't know why, but, you know, when we had... Well, the environmental, When we had, when we had it, right? a regulated industry, we produced enough power, and we didn't have the high electric rates we have today. Now, you can say it's not because of deregulation, but so then tell me what it's all about. We don't you know, produce any power. We don't build and nuclear why plants. Why is that? We had... It's, we because, had, well, it's we, an unfriendly environment. We, yeah. we had power generation going on. We had the utilities building power plants before. One of the reasons why we have the, the, um, the surcharge on the bills today that got securitized for another 10 years is, is for the stranded costs that were left over when the deregulation happened. So there was power being generated, and there were, there were programs in place, there were capital investments in place during the time of, de of regulation, well, and now there's not. Right, but and we're build, building coal plants, and now coal plants are pretty much undesirable up here, right? Uh, coal plants are undesirable anywhere. Well, I like them. I build more. Uh, I think I would. I, I think uh, coal I is a source of great clean energy. I would. Uh, well, wow. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why, but why do you say? Have you ever heard of scrubbers, though? I mean, scrubbers strip all the sulfur out, right? 
So, I mean, coal plants that are built today are very environmentally friendly. I don't know why They're there's... They're certainly better than what we've got in the Midwest today that are pumping all the, the stuff our way. So, yeah, you know, there, there certainly are better, and better ways of doing things today than there were in the past. The, the question is, and you hit it a moment ago, is that we haven't built anything here, therefore we're not generating power, and so we have to buy it from somewhere else and it's more expensive. Let me ask you one other question along the same lines. I, I appreciate the need to attract business here. I'm all in favor of that. I want, I want to, what can you do to try and keep companies here? And I'll give you an example. I have friends that work out at Sikorsky. Sikorsky is one of the biggest manufacturers in Connecticut, right? Yeah. Fantastic organization. They are systematically, slowly but surely, taking pieces, bits and pieces of that uh, manufacturing process, construction process, and, and sending it down south, sending it down south. So one day you walk in and now there's a huge room and it's empty because went down south, went down south. I mean, I think within five years we could, we're in danger of potentially losing Sikorsky here. That would be a major blow to Connecticut. It would. What can we do to keep Sikorsky here? Um, that's, that's a difficult question and one that we have to address. What I, what I see in other states is that when those companies move, those other states are extraordinarily active in getting that to happen. Mm -hmm. So you can turn on NPR. Uh, I, I listen to WSHU down out of, out of uh, Fairfield. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear public service announcements from Florida and South Carolina enticing people to relocate their businesses down there. Could it be because they don't have any state income tax? Uh, could be, but it also could be because they're putting together deals. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in North Carolina, if you relocate, uh, they'll come to you and say, look, what does your business need in terms of trained people? You have this process, you have these pieces of equipment, we'll buy them, we'll put them in our community colleges, we'll train people so that when you come you don't have that cost. We're not doing that here. So there are lots of things that you can do besides simply cutting taxes. Um, you, you need to be focused on, I think, what the two most important things are for building a business. Um, you obviously have to have a, an educated workforce and you have to have a transportation infrastructure that will support businesses. And, by, and that means that your customers can get to you, your suppliers can get to you, your employees can get to you. And right now, in Fairfield County, especially lower Fairfield County where I am, the transportation infrastructure is awful. You get on, uh, get on I-95 in the morning and you don't go anywhere. Right. Get on the trains in the morning and they're really full. Uh, you try to park at the train station, you've got a five-year wait to get a parking permit in Westport. Right. Those are things that yep. can only be addressed by government. We're not going to have private enterprise come in and build us a new, a new interstate or build a new railroad or put in new parking lots at train stations. This is a government responsibility. We've, we haven't lived up to that responsibility and those kinds of things eat away at the base. And people don't want to come here when they can't easily get around, when they can't get their customers to their, to their businesses. And I want to touch on that real quick because the last time you were here two years ago, and in fact as long as I can remember myself on this show, I've always talked about the major problem in this area, especially in the 26th district. I'm seeing some of these towns like Bessel and Redding and Ridgefield and Weston. Is transportation. That Metro North Line is so horrible. I think the last time you were here you were talking about the levers, how to go out there and, and uh, push the levers. It, I think the be all, the end all is just pure transportation. If you want to entice businesses and stuff to come here, you got to get, you got to show them that you got good, good transportation, which I'm we don't on, have in this area at all. I'm on the Metro North Rail Commuter Council, so I was appointed to that a year ago. Um, I meet mo once a month with people from all up and down the line. Our job is to represent the interests of the commuters to the railroad. We have. Uh, monthly meetings with the, t the, the, uh, the commissioner of DOT or uh, the deputy commissioner, high level people are there. We talk to people of the MTA. There's some good news and bad news. The good news is that we have 300 rail cars that are on order. Um, eight of them, I think, are actually here in the country undergoing testing. They'll start revenue service by the end of the year. Once we get up to uh, full build, we'll have 10 more coming on a month. Uh, Governor Rell wanted to order an extra 80 cars. She actually had a press conference that I was at in New Haven a month ago, but when she got to the bonding commission, she pulled it back. So those 80 cars are still in limbo. That's good news. And at least the 300 are on their way. They're, they're going to be paid for. They're going to come. Um, the Danbury line, good news on the Danbury line. They're going to be putting in, they've just started now in August, uh, a two-year project 
to upgrade the signal uh, system, which means that they won't have to get out in the future right. and throw the signals by hand, which will allow, therefore, trains to go up and down at the same time because there are places where they can pass but there's just not any there wasn't any way to, to safely control them so right. right now in the morning all the trains go down the hill right and if you're in uh, Ridgefield and you've got uh, you know a business that you want to hire somebody from Bridgeport who wants to come by train they can't in the right. morning because all the trains are going down the hill yeah. in the future a couple of years from now we'll be able to have trains running in both directions and passing safely in various places along that line so there are some good things that are happening. I would support a train extension from Danbury out to New Milford. And I would build three new stations along the way, and uh, we would electrify that entire line. Uh, that would cost a lot of money. But those are the kinds of investments that you reap the benefits for not Absolutely. just 10 years or 20 years, they're for 50 years or 100 years. Right. This is the, the train system we have now is because people in the 1800s were building train lines along the coast. Right. Uh, and so we're still using that. But and by the way, we still have to invest in it. We can't let go. We can't just ride on that. Right. I mean, I think it's ridiculous that people in Ridgefield have to say, well, I'm not going to take the Danbury line. I'm going to get in my car, go down to Saw, down to Saw Mill and pick up on the Harlem line over in New York. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense, and it's because we just have an absolutely a joke of a, of a Danbury line here. Yeah, I agree. Um, we're in the last 10 minutes. I want to go to the lightning round. I want to ask a couple quick questions. Uh, Governor Christie in New Jersey, you see what he's doing. He's taking on some of the teacher unions yeah. and some of the costs, and he's taking them head on, and he's going with a no tax increase. Critique him. You like what he's doing? You don't like what he's doing? I think uh, he seems I think to be doing what you say can't be done. I, You know, it, it's... We'll see how he gets there. He's he's definitely taking things head on, and um, you know he's a very interesting guy. We'll have to see see how it plays out. You okay. know? A little lukewarm endorsement, uh, but okay. I, no, listen, uh, we have to come to the table with some new ideas, mm. and he's doing that. And let's see how they work. Okay, because he's say, he's coming in and no. he's saying no taxes. Right. We're going to take the unions let's head see, on. Let's, let's see, see if they can come now. up George, with more than Remember a, George Bush the first said no new taxes, and then he he raised taxes. And then he got voted out. And then he got voted out. Do You're the math on right. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk just raw politics. Um, I thought it, that's what we were doing. No, we're talking <laughs> policy. It's interesting, uh, okay. and I and I appreciate your website, and, and we have it up on the on the screen too. If people want to get involved in your okay. campaign, they can go to the website. Thank you. Uh, right there, the, the opening. I mean, some of the some of the footage. I don't know if we can get a picture of this. I mean, the the warmth of this guy. Look at just uh, look at the picture. The <laughs> great. Look at the elderly people in need of government, Indeed. and there's John right there. Oh, just yeah. Everything's Smiling. fine. The trains are going to run. Yeah. Everything's going to be just fine. Just give us some more of your money and uh, it'll be fine. Sorry, I, that was got to get the knife in there. All right, all right. But, but raw <laughs> politics, is this a good year for the Democrats to no, run? No, it's not, obviously. Do you, are you a glutton for punishment, or do you, just, do you just enjoy the process? I like, have a great Look, time. I run for stuff. I run, tried to run against Rudy Marconi. I got my head handed to You did. It. You but did. I did kind of enjoy the process. Yeah. So maybe I'm a glutton for punishment. But You're what are on your this thoughts? show every week. You must enjoy it. I know, it. I know. I, You're I really, smiling all the time. I, know. I, need, to, I need to talk to my psychiatrist. It may, have, it may have to do with I think this you is know. your psychiatrist. Yeah, I think it is. This is our way. But what, what do you I mean? It's a tough year. It's a very tough year. Yeah, no doubt about it. And right. and my opponent is uh, is very strong. So, you know, she's she's tough and she's out there and I'm out there and we'll see what happens in, in November. Are you up for another one of these televised debates? We're running out of Thursdays. Listen, I'm now. having a hard time getting her to the table. Really? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of times it's the other way around, like well, Jim Hine and Chris Murphy. She, oh, she, you know, I, I got a call tonight. I got a call tonight. We had a debate scheduled down in Westport with the League of Women Voters. The date was secure. I've seen the emails. Suddenly, she's got another meeting she wants to go to, and she wants to move the date. So uh -huh. uh, we had uh, debates uh, two years ago in Wilton mm -hmm. uh, through the League of Women Voters. Nobody calling this time to set up a debate for the League of Women Voters in we Wilton, which, is, right here which is her home territory. You so, almost went so to blows. Tony, you were talking to Tony, her if you're out there, set up one in you, Wilton. You were talking and to her. And come to the one in Westport that you agreed to already. We had a date. You know, let's not move it. Let's keep to the debate. And if you want to come here, I'm all in. Hey, do we have time for one more question? Yes. It's a quick one. All right, yeah. this, one's quick out of, question, this one's out of the blue. This one's out of the blue, out of left field. Okay. Um, some time ago, you were a strong advocate of opposing the uh, Patriot Act. 
That's right, I was. Can you give me give me some talking points? What, why, what, why are you in opposition why, to it? Because the overbearing government is going to sneak around your emails and find out secret stuff about so you and use it against you. That's what's going to happen. So I was, I was and we're against right that there. stuff. We're against what's going on. So you, but then all of a sudden when they come into office, eh, the Patriot Act is not that bad an idea. We're I just am, trying to I keep am, track I'm of it. I'm disappointed in some of the things that the Obama administration has done. Oh, it's terrible. we got to no, get out of Afghanistan. Don't worry about it. When he gets in office, they're adding troops to Afghanistan. Oh, excuse me. He ran he on Afghanistan as the good on. war. Afghanistan's a good one. He right. ran on that. But Iraq was the big success. Yeah, what about, oh. what about all these debates on C-SPAN? It was going to be open government. I, we were going to cut deals. You I, remember? You, you probably still got your Obama 08 sticker on your geez. car, don't you? I probably have one in my, in my uh, package right here. I don't know. Okay, I understand. Oh, so, oh wow. See, now, what, what that tells me is the Vikings have gone down the field and kicked three field goals. They're not getting it in the end zone. Sorry. <laughs> uh, go, go right ahead. Go so, ahead. So, Patriot Act, why, why were you opposed to that? I thought the Patriot Act was a horrible intrusion in the privacy of American citizens. I thought that it set up um, uh, secret courts that didn't need to be done. And uh, I think we will rue the day that that was done. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing to do. And I say when you got terrorists that are, you know, hanging out in apartments in, in Bridgeport and, you know, driving uh, and we Jeep caught Cherokees. Him. Yeah, we caught them after the thing smoked and some guy selling hats yeah. in the and going, hey, the Cherokee's yeah. smoking. The system worked, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, with, the with, the tape, with the Patriot Act, you didn't catch them. So I know. That's, Maybe we that need was to double down on those what's, calls What's with waterboarding, waterboarding in college? We All call right. it a swirly. My guest tonight has been John Hartwell. John, really appreciate it very much. I'll call Tony. Let's see if we can get it, uh, get it done. There's a Tony, you listen, come on down. <laughs> Join us next week. Next week, it's going to be exciting in the big show. We're going to have Dan Carter, a war veteran, against uh, Jason Bartlett. He's stepping up. The incumbent's stepping up. Stepping up for the debate. Absolutely. Join us next Thursday night right here, 9 to 10. What else are you going to do? Go New, uh, New Orleans Saints. I'm sure they're going to win, and I'm so sure they're going to come. The old man's taking it down the field. Uh, uh, we're gonna, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> See you next week.